What a strong one. The house will be in order. The house will be in order. Members are asked to vacate the well. Members and staff are advised to take their conversations off the floor. The house will be in order. The House will be in order. Members are asked to vacate the well. <laughs> the House will be in order. Members are asked to vacate the well. Members and staff are advised to take their conversations off the floor. The gentleman's correct. The House is not in order. The House will be in order. Members and staff are advised to take their conversations off the floor. The House will be in order. The House will be in order. Chair is prepared to entertain one minute requests. For what purpose does the gentleman from Pennsylvania rise? Madam Speaker, request unanimous consent to address the House for one minute and to revise and extend. The gentleman is recognized for one minute. The gentleman will suspend while the House comes to order. The House will be in order. The House will be in order. The gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the Penn State IFC Panhellenic Dance Marathon, referred to as THON, is a year-long effort to raise funds and awareness for the fight against pediatric cancer. THON is the largest student-run philanthropy in the world, with 700 dancers, more than 300 supporting organizations, and more than 15,000 volunteers involved in the annual event. Since 1977, THON has raised more than $78 million for the four diamond funds at Penn State Hershey Children's Hospital. This year, THON 2012 took place from February 17th to the 19th. At this year's event, Penn State York broke its own record, raising $17,160.71, the largest amount it has ever raised for THON, and made it to the top ten in fundraisers among Penn State campuses. THON has helped so many families through the Four Diamonds Fund. This, this critical support for pediatric cancer research has enabled some pediatric cancer survival rates to increase to nearly 90 percent. I want to congratulate the Penn State University IFC Panhellenic Dance Marathon on its continued success in supporting of the Four Diamonds Fund and for their amazing record-breaking total for this year's event. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. House will be in order. Purposes, gentlelady from Texas, rise. Without objection, gentlelady has one minute. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday I came to the floor of the House, and I think I was generally pleading with my colleagues and uh, responding to the tragedy of an incident that occurred last Thursday, where a person that was supposed to be attending to seven babies under three years old now has been found allegedly to have left to go grocery shopping 
to come back to a grease fire in the kitchen and to find that four babies, three and under, were killed. Two are now in the burn unit. These are possibly babies supported by federal funding for child care, licensed by the state of Texas, someone 22 years old. All we can do is provide funding for desperate parents. Can we at least expect the criteria to be reasonable? Now we have the district attorney's office indicating that they can't find the suspect, that they have fled because they waited three days to find any charges against someone who was responsible for four dead babies. We understand they've asked the U.S. Marshal. We don't even know whether they've asked the State Department to help. It is a crying shame, and I'm getting to the bottom of it. Dead babies deserve justice. I yield back. It's back. For what purposes does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? Request permission to address the House for one minute. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, it's been five months since David Hartley was brutally murdered by pirates on Falcon Lake. His body remains missing, and those responsible for this border murder remain at large. Shamefully, the only American peace officer apparently still working on this case is Sheriff Ziggy Gonzalez of Zapata County. He has identified four of the seven shooters as Zeta cartel members. At least there's still somebody on the case. The local sheriffs cannot do the job that they are supposed to do of protecting their counties while doing the federal government's job of protecting the border as well. Sixty-five Americans were murdered in Mexico last year, and not one case has been solved. Unfortunately, some of the Mexican border law enforcement personnel are in cahoots with the drug cartels. That relationship breeds incompetence and corruption. And until the FBI, the State Department, and Homeland Security get fully engaged in the murder of Americans in Mexico, it will be the responsibility of local sheriffs to keep the peace on the border. And that's just the way it is. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Pennsylvania seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, uh, last week I had a chance to gain feedback from my neighbors in Pennsylvania's 11th Congressional District, and what I heard should concern us all. From my home-to-house town hall forum to the numerous meetings I held all over the district, my constituents are deeply concerned with the state of our economy and its effect on our communities. Just one week after I submitted an amendment to restore $42 million to the Community Development Fund, I had the chance to get a first-hand look at some of the food banks and after-school programs that benefit from this critical resource. I also had the opportunity to hear from many who share my apprehension about spending reductions to the Low Income Housing Energy Assistance Program, LIHEAP. I learned that 3,036 requests for LIHEAP grants were received from Wilkes-Barre and Hazleton in the past two months alone. I thank all of those who have made the effort to share their thoughts and concerns with me, and I look forward to receiving more feedback in the future. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Georgia seek recognition? Request permission to address that for one minute by the general in the office. Without objection, thank you, Mr. Speaker. For one minute. Imagine in your own household if for every dollar you spent, 40 cents was borrowed. Obviously, you would sit down with your family at the kitchen table and say, okay, every dollar we spend, 40 cents is borrowed. We're going to have to change our purchasing habits. That's what American families do. That's what farmers do. That's what small businesses do each and every day. And yet, for some reason, the U.S. Congress thinks it can defy gravity and not worry about this deficit, which now is one and a half trillion dollars. The debt is nearly 90 percent of the GDP, and we owe much of this money to China. We have got to make tough decisions, and it's not time for partisan politics. We need to come together as Democrats and Republicans and do what American families, farmers, and small businesses do every day, every year. We need to reduce spending and turn this ship around. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. 
from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I send to the desk two privileged report from the Committee on Rules for Filing Under the Rule. The gentleman will suspend. The clerk will report the title of the resolution. Report to accompany House Resolution 128, resolution providing for consideration of the bill, H.R. 662, to provide an extension of federal aid highway, highway safety, motor carrier safety, transit, and other programs funding out of the Highway Trust Fund pending enactment of a multi-year law reauthorization such programs. House Resolution 129, resolution providing for consideration of the bill, H.R. 4, to repeal the expansion of information reporting requirements for payments of $600 or more to corporations and for other purposes. Referred to the House calendar and ordered printed. Lays before the House the following personal request. Leave of absence requested for Mr. Marchant of Texas for today. Are there further one minute requests? Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Gingry, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the majority leader. Mr. Speaker, I, I thank you and I thank uh, Speaker Boehner uh, and my leadership uh, for giving me an opportunity and my colleagues uh, during this next hour to talk about uh, something that is, yes indeed, still fresh on everybody's mind and that of course is uh, the passage on March the 23rd, 2010, uh, almost a year ago now, uh, of uh, something that some might affectionately refer to as Obamacare. I guess officially we would say Patient Protection uh, and Affordable Care Act. Uh, some people struggle with the acronym of uh, uh, Papa Care, uh, but uh, whatever you uh, uh, call it, uh, this Health Care Reform Act uh, that was passed uh, last year uh, is something that the American people uh, have been and continue to be opposed to, the preponderance uh, of the American people. We are taking this opportunity, Mr. Speaker, uh, as a designee of the majority uh, during this hour to talk uh, a little bit more specifically about why we feel the way we feel, why the American people, why our constituents keep telling us uh, even a year later after President Obama uh, signed uh, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, uh, I think uh, the, the bill number was uh, 3590, uh, into law. Why they're still uh, uh, worried about it, opposed to it, uh, and, and that's what we're going to be spending our time here in the next hour is discussing that issue. Uh, I have a number of my colleagues, Mr. Speaker, who are members of the GOP House Doctors Caucus. Now, in that Doctors Caucus, we have uh, all health care providers, not all MDs, uh, a lot of MDs, uh, but we also have some dentists. Uh, we have uh, a clinical PhD psychologist. Uh, and now with our new freshman class, uh, we have three registered nurses uh, on our side of the aisle, Mr. Speaker, so the, the Republican GOP Doctors Caucus is growing, uh, growing uh, almost double uh, in the 112th Congress as compared to the 111th. So many of my colleagues in the, in the Doctors Caucus uh, will be part of this discussion. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, point out to my colleagues on both sides of the aisle uh, a couple of slides uh, before yielding time to the other members uh, of the Doctors' Caucus. Uh, this, this first uh, slide uh, that I'm pointing out to you, GOP Doctors' Caucus, of course, Obamacare hurts states and patients. Uh, I know that uh, uh, a lot of uh, the discussion today 
will be about the strain that certain provisions of this bill place on our 50 states, not just my home state of Georgia. I, I do want to talk a little bit about that in the strain that uh, my governor uh, and the members of the Georgia General Assembly are experiencing in trying to balance a, a budget uh, when they have all this added requirement uh, under the sections pertaining to Medicaid. Uh, so that's what I mean when I say in this slide that uh, the GOP doctors caucus feel that Obamacare hurts states uh, and certainly potentially hurts patients. Uh, I'd ask my colleagues to also, again on both sides of the aisle, because I, I, we're, our purpose here is to inform. Uh, not to be overly critical, but I think it's very important that we state the facts as we see them, as we know them. Uh, and this uh, slide a little bit further to my left, uh, Obamacare, and it says, if you can't see it, you can have whatever you like as long as the boss approves it. The boss, if you remember from that uh, pretty popular TV series, The Dukes of Hazard. That would be Boss Hogg. Now, if you're wondering who I'm referencing in regard to uh, the boss, I'm referencing the federal government, uh, Mr. Speaker, not any individual, uh, but the federal government. Uh, and it was said many times in the markup of this bill and the lead up to this bill, uh, which as I say, we call Obamacare, you can have whatever you like as long as the boss approves it. And just in this year alone, the boss, if the boss in this instance happens to be uh, Secretary Sebelius and the Department of, Homel of uh, Health and Human Services, has had to grant, now listen to this, my colleagues, has had to grant 733 waivers to make sure that this pledge of if you uh, like what you have, you can keep it. Otherwise, without those waivers, you couldn't. 733 of them. So this is, this is what we're going to talk about tonight, and I, I thank my colleagues for being on the floor and joining with me. At this point, uh, one, of, one of the members of the GOP Doctors Caucus, uh, in his second term, uh, a gastroenterologist uh, of a, a number of years practicing uh, in Louisiana, uh, my good friend, uh, Representative and Dr. Bill Cassidy. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gingrey. Now, Dr. Gingrey, I'm struck. Sometimes folks think that when we speak about health care, we're only speaking about health care. That seems kind of a simplistic statement, but let's think about it. Right now, states are having these huge budget crises. We see in Wisconsin where there's a protest. We see in um, some states where there may be as much as a $10 billion budget deficit. In my state of Louisiana, there's a $1 to $2 billion budget deficit. And, and if you think about this a little bit deeply, you understand that this can be related to health care. Now, specifically Medicaid. Medicaid, for those watching who are unfamiliar with it, is a combined program in which the state puts up some money and the federal government puts up some of the money, and with this it is used to care for the elderly, for pregnant women, for children, typically people of low income. Well, as it turns out, it is this program which is bankrupting the states. It, a state, if you're paying this amount for health care, and this amount for roads and this amount for education, as the amount for health care increases, you either raise taxes or you decrease spending on the other areas. Now, as it turns out, this has had tremendous impact. Today, the governor of Massachusetts came and spoke to one of our committees regarding the impact of, of their health care program, which is very similar to the bill just passed last Congress, in Massachusetts. And I was struck how what a nice view he gave of it. If you, if you heard Governor Patrick speak, I didn't have a chance to ask him questions, but if you heard him speak, there's no problems with it whatsoever. But as I logged on and, say, read the Boston Globe, I, I learned different things. First, I learned that in Massachusetts, which has already implemented a program like this, the amount of money, spending, the amount of money spent on health care has gone from 21 percent of the state budget in the year 2000 to 37 percent now. So from 21 percent to 37 percent is the amount the state of Massachusetts is now spending on health care. 
Well, you can only imagine the crowd out effect that has on spending for other issues. Uh, the uh, governor, again, as he went on and praised their program, uh, said that there's been no problems paying for it. Well, as it turns out, and according to the paper, there's about a $1.5 billion to $2 billion shortfall in the Massachusetts budget. And in Massachusetts, the governor of Massachusetts has said that the Medicaid spending is unsustainable. Hmm, that's different. So this is, if you will, the beta version of the Affordable Care Act, or as I call it, the Unaffordable Care Act. This is the beta version of it, but it gives us an idea of what our future is going to be like. Now, in order to deal with these costs, again, I'm quoting the Globe, it says that most recently dental benefits have been slashed, that's the quote, slashed for hundreds of thousands of Massachusetts Medicaid patients, and they have lost access to their dentist. Now, by the way, the goals of health care reform are to provide affordable, quality, health care that is accessible to all. But if you don't afford it, if you can't afford it, you eventually lose access. And I think what we found in Massachusetts is that, is that the, the uh, inability to afford is, of course, decreasing access. And it's not just the fact that these folks lost access to their dentist. Last year, folks who were recent immigrants to the United States who have been enrolled upon Medicaid in Massachusetts were disenrolled. So if you will, this Massachusetts Medicaid program that has grown from 21% of the Massachusetts budget to 37% and still growing, now the cost is being controlled by denying access. Now, we also mentioned the third goal of Medicaid, excuse me, of health care reform, which is quality care. You know, there's actually now concerns about the quality of health care afforded by Medicaid. If you will, if you will, there was a study recently reported in the Archives of Surgery in which someone looked at the outcomes of patients covered by Medicaid, Medicare, on private insurance or uninsured. As it turns out, they say of all four groups, the cost and length of stay associated with Medicaid was longer than the rest. Also, mortality rates. Now, that's a way to say how many people die. Mortality rates associated with uninsured, Medicare, private insurance, Medicaid, was highest for Medicaid. So if you had Medicaid, you had a higher death rate uh, from your hospitalization than if you're on private insurance, if you're on Medicare, and if you're uninsured. Now, it's so counterintuitive that being on Medicaid is worse than being uninsured in terms of outcomes. Clearly, this is a study, this is an issue that has to be studied further, but it certainly calls into question the very premise of using Medicaid as the basis for, for health care reform. Just to make the point, under the Affordable Care Act or the Unaffordable Care Act, many people are insured, 20 million Americans are put on Medicaid as a way for them to be now insured. And yet, if we see that it's bankrupting states, it's clearly not affordable. If we see that it is because it's not affordable, states are now denying access to care, as is the case in Massachusetts, and the care that is provided is a problematic quality, we can say to ourselves that this is not the basis for reform. It's like the antithesis of reform. So uh, I'll yield back to you, Dr. Gingrey, just pointing out that this not only involves health care, but also in for, uh, uh, involves our ability of a state to afford other things like roads and education and to use that state government, federal government program as the basis for reform it does not serve patients, does not serve the states. I yield back. Well, I thank the gentleman uh, from uh, Louisiana, Mr. Speaker. Uh, at this time, I want to yield uh, a little bit of time to our colleague, uh, freshman member, new member of the Doctors' Caucus, uh, registered nurse from uh, the great state of North Carolina, uh, Renee uh, Elmers, Representative Elmers, uh, has worked uh, in a medical practice with her husband who is an MD, and uh, we look forward to her comments, and at this time I yield as much time as she may use to Renee Elmers. 
Thank you. I, ju I just want to um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to just contribute a little bit more on the um, the overall burden that the that Obamacare places on our states in in covering patients on Medicaid. Um, as we've seen, that this has grown, especially with the recession and the undue cost to our states' budgets to provide Medicaid at no cost sharing from the patients. I think that this is a key issue. Um, it's basically free health care for those individuals at taxpayer expense. And it's just a huge strain on our state's budgets, as, as my colleague has pointed out. One of the, one of the key factors, and, and very important, certainly very important in health care, are the preventative um, mandates. Um, certainly preventative medicine is, is a way that we can all heal, that we can all be looking for those issues that, that can, can down the road prevent excessive costs. But such things as no co-pays or deductibles for colonoscopies, mammograms, such things like this, you know, they're again an undue cost to our states at taxpayer expense. It's just too much of a burden. You know, I want to help everyone. I think that everyone should be able to have health care. And if you, as we know, if you pull up to an emergency room in any hospital across the country, you will receive health care. So the misnomer that there are those individuals who are not receiving health care is really an untrue statement. Now, of course, you're going to receive a bill for that care. And I think that just as if you go to the grocery store and you, you have your cart full of groceries, when you check out, you have to pay for it. It's the same thing with health care. Health care is a business. And someone has to pay for it. But when we continuously pass this cost on to our taxpayers and, of course, our state budgets, it is just unbelievably difficult. And, of course, that is what Obamacare does. It increases the number of patients on Medicaid, and it is just an unsustainable cost if to our state. If the gentlelady would uh, let me reclaim my time for just a second, and then I, I will yield back to her. Uh, co colleagues, look at uh, this first slide again. Uh, the, the, the heading, who is the boss, and of course we've already talked about uh, Boss Hogg, and I said at the outset, uh, the federal government is the boss, uh, but there are one, two, three, four, five bullet points under that, uh, and this is really what Representative uh, 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 Elmers is referring to in regard to uh, the federal government putting all of these mandates uh, onto the state budgets. Uh, 159 new boards, agencies, and commissions created by Obamacare to support the boss, the government. 159 new boards. 16,000 new IRS agents help the boss, the government, enforce the new law. Uh, that's a report from the House Ways and Means Committee. Uh, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Kathleen Sebelius, uh, under this uh, law, this 2,400-page monstrosity is given broad, broad new powers to run Obamacare, uh, rulemaking, regulatory authority. Uh, no wonder the doctors and their patients are scared to death. Uh, and then, of course, the new director of uh, CMS, the Committee of, on Medicare and Medicaid Services, uh, Dr. Donald Berwick, uh, a brilliant man, a Harvard-trained doctor, uh, MD, written several books. Unfortunately, in those books, uh, Mr. Speaker, he talks about uh, rationing of care. It's not, uh, I think, his, I, I, this is a paraphrase of a quote, uh, it's not uh, uh, if we ration, it's how we ration. Uh, and again, these are the things that, uh, uh, that we have great fear of. The CBO actually, in this last bullet point, mm -hmm. Congressional Budget Office, nonpartisan, says it will cost between five and ten billion dollars just to hire all these new employees needing to help the boss, the government, run Obamacare. I yield back to the gentlewoman. I would like to expand upon what um, some of the points that you're making there. You know, we're, we're t basically talking about the same issues, and we can see what, what an increased cost this is going to be and how, how incredibly difficult it will be to put this in place. And, you know, this is yet another situation where 
the good intentions and well-meaning intentions that are put forward to help this situation are just truly not the answer. Um, you know, basically, how do we increase the access to health care coverage? Medicaid is not the route to take. It just, it, there again, passes too much cost on to our states, and it, and it is not, it, it is an imperfect um, situation. And I'll expand a little bit on the um, Congressional Budget Office numbers. Um, very conservative estimates indicate federal spending for Medicaid is expected to reach $427 billion by 2019. And the Congressional Budget Office notes that the program will consume more than 4% of GDP by 2050. You know, one of the um, unintended consequences to this, you know, we were talking about some of these, um, you know, bad situations, poor outcomes. One of the things that we're saying, or the, what we're seeing right now, um, unfortunately, in health care as we move into this transition um, into Obamacare, are the uh, decrease in Medicaid reimbursements to physicians. They're not very good to begin with, and, and they, I would say that that's probably going to decrease to doctors and hospitals um, as we decrease the reimbursement to hospitals especially. Um, this will basically, you, we were talking about the possibility of rationing of care and knowing that, that this is down the line and um, the quotes, of course, um, um, that we see from um, centers of Medicare and Medicaid. Um, but basically what, what we're seeing here is that physicians will be forced to ha have to stop taking Medicaid patients. As we all know, physician offices are businesses. They're small business owners. They have staff that they have to pay. They have payroll that they have to meet. And unfortunately, when faced with a situation like this, we're already seeing it with Medicare as well. Physicians, you know, having to dial back on the number of Medicare and Medicaid patients that they're seeing. This ultimately will not help the situation and get that health care for, for the American public that we're looking for. If this is the answer, I do, well, let's just say it's not the answer. We're creating another problem with this solution. Um, and, and once again, how will we deal with that down the road with these incredibly large numbers of costs that we're passing on to our taxpayers? Well, reclaiming my time, and I, Mr. Speaker, I, again, I thank the, the uh, gentlewoman from uh, North Carolina and hope she'll stay with us uh, during the remaining portion of the hour, and we'll like to yield additional time to her later uh, in the hour. At this time, I would like to yield uh, to another freshman member, uh, another uh, physician member, Mr. Speaker, uh, and also uh, I'm proud that he, he was a member now of the uh, House GOP Doctors Caucus, uh, and, and I will yield time now to my good friend from Indiana, Dr. Larry Bouchon. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gingrey. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I rise today to talk about how Obamacare will hurt my state and ultimately hurt my patients. And I'd like to start with an example of the Medicaid program. As a cardiothoracic surgeon in Evansville, Indiana, I see a lot of patients from neighboring states because we're right in the corner next to Illinois and Kentucky. Many of these patients are Medicaid patients and without treatment face grave results. However, every year, the Illinois Medicaid program runs out of money in September, October. They don't have enough money to fund the entire year. And what does that mean? That means that without denying any patient's care that they need and deserve, my practice was forced to delay billing to the Medicaid system of Illinois. And then once the new fiscal year came into play, about 50% of those claims were subsequently denied by Illinois Medicaid. So those patients uh, that came over for our services, they don't have quality health insurance, Mr. Speaker. Some physicians in my community don't even bother to bill the Medicaid program in some states at all. This is an example of the, of the broken Medicaid system, a system that has many issues focusing on the access to quality health care. And it was said earlier, you see the outcome difference between Medicaid and, and 
private insurance patients because we have an access and quality problem with these patients. A system that Obamacare will break even more by adding millions of Americans to the state's Medicaid rolls. It's estimated that this may cost the state of Indiana as much as $3.6 billion to cover these folks. From Indiana, we have an innovative and effective solution, and, that, and that's called the Healthy Indiana Plan. Beginning in January 2008, uninsured Hoosiers between the ages of 19 and 64 started enrolling in this plan, a consumer-driven health care plan. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to enter the Healthy Indiana Plan fact sheet into the record. Without objection. Thank you. Healthy Indiana Plan operates on an 1115 demonstration waiver from CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Due to the program's success, the state of Indiana would like to use the Healthy Indiana Plan as a coverage vehicle for the newly eligible population under Obamacare. This has been requested by my state of Health and Human Services, but to this point, we've not heard a response about whether this will be possible. And I'm hoping that we get a response in the positive direction because this is a great program. The plan is for citizens that earn less than 200 percent of the federal poverty level and works on a sliding scale for individual contributions based on the ability to pay that cannot exceed more than 5 percent of his or her gross family income. Each participant is enrolled in a health savings account valued at about $1,100 and will not make co-pays except for, uh, for non-emergency use of the emergency room. And believe it or not, this program reimburses providers at a Medicare, not Medicaid level. This gives citizens a financial incentive to adopt healthy, li healthy lifestyles and personal responsibility to make their own health care decisions. Healthy Indiana Plan is an innovative, market-based, consumer-driven health care plan that is working. In a recent survey, 94 percent of Healthy Indiana Plan participants are satisfied for the, with the program, and 99 percent indicated they would re-enroll. There's data in the fact sheet that I've included in the congressional record showing the success of this plan, both for patients and both for uh, the state of Indiana. It's a common sense market-based solution, solution to a broken Medicaid system that Obamacare does nothing to fix, but only further, further burdens my state and all states and will ultimately continue to hurt patients' access to quality health care in America. So I would urge everyone to review what the state of Indiana has done with its Healthy Indiana Plan. And with that, uh, Dr. Gingri, I yield back uh, my time. Thank you. Representative Bouchon, thank you for yielding back and uh, thank you for staying with us. I, I think that, Mr. Speaker, uh, the good doctor is pointing out uh, some things that, that our colleagues on both sides of the aisle and the American people n need to understand. Uh, this, uh, this plan that was just described to us by Representative Bouchon, the Healthy Indiana Plan, it's so typical of what the states uh, are capable of doing, Mr. Speaker, if they're allowed to do that. Uh, but we have great concerns, and I say we, I'm talking about uh, the governors of, of all 50 states, be they Republican or Democrat, uh, and the territories, uh, to be told by the boss, again, uh, that no, you can't, you can't be uh, an incubation center. You cannot be innovative in regard to developing a, a health care plan for those who can't afford to purchase health insurance on their own uh, and, and they qualify for uh, safety net programs like the, the federal state shared program Medicaid uh, in the states, Indiana, my own state of Georgia, uh, uh, Governor uh, um, Herbert testified before the Energy and Commerce Committee today uh, in regard to what he's doing in Utah. In fact, they had already set up exchanges at the state level uh, five or six years ago, long before uh, uh, this uh, Patient Protection Affordable Care Act was uh, even on the drawing board. 
Uh, but when, when you have things in the bill, when the boss writes a section of the bill that says, states, we, it doesn't matter that you have to balance your budget. We don't at the federal level. But we're going to dictate to you uh, that you're going to have to start covering Medicaid constituency up to 138% of the federal poverty level. We're going to put that into law. That's part of this new law, Obamacare, and you have no choice. Now, we're going to uh, give you a little breathing room, and uh, we're going to say it's not going to start uh, for a couple of years, indeed, January of 2014, uh, you've got to expand your Medicaid rolls from the typical state covers 100% of the federal poverty level. This goes up to 138% of the federal, federal poverty level. Uh, and, and, and the boss says, well, uh, we'll, we'll pay uh, all of it with federal dollars for the first couple of years, but we're going to phase that out. And then, oh yes, guess what happens? The boss adds eventually at the end of the day, $60 billion to state Medicaid costs. Uh, and also, there's a section in the bill, Mr. Speaker, that tells the states, uh, and it's called maintenance of effort. You can't change one thing that you currently do uh, in your Medicaid program to prepare yourself for this tsunami. If you're covering today 185% of the federal poverty level, you can't all of a sudden say, well, gosh, you know, we're going to have to lower that to 150% uh, and put some oats away and get ready for that real rainy day in 2014. We, we uh, uh, heard from uh, another governor today uh, in that hearing. There were three. Uh, governor Deval Patrick of uh, Massachusetts was one, and... Governor Haley Barber from Mississippi, Mr. Speaker, was the other. And Governor Barber was saying that uh, a couple of years ago, he instituted a program in the state of Mississippi that would, would make sure that people that were on the Medicaid program were eligible, that they, they deserved to be there. Uh, they weren't eating somebody else's lunch, uh, as the expression would go. Uh, they weren't illegal immigrants. Uh, their income uh, wasn't too high to make them eligible for this safety net program. And, of course, Mr. Speaker, as we all know, thank goodness, uh, income uh, from year to year can get better. We're still waiting for that to happen. Uh, I think uh, Obamacare and some of these other uh, policies that we've seen over the last four years is preventing that from happening. But so Governor Barber would make people come and uh, and face-to-face -face verify that they were still eligible from year to year. As I understand it, this, this rule, this maintenance of effort, would prohibit, he's already done it in Mississippi, but in any other state as an example, to make sure your rolls were clean and you were covering the people that were eligible and that really needed uh, that care. So this is the kind of thing that we're, we're, we're dealing with and and why we're talking about this tonight and why we're talking about it so passionately. Mr. Speaker, at this time, I, I want to uh, uh, call on my, my colleague from uh, Tennessee, uh, another new member, a delightful new member, uh, already, already assuming leadership positions and going to, going to do a great job here. Diane Black from Tennessee, and I yield to her at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I rise today as a registered nurse who worked in emergency rooms and caring for patients. I also rise as a former member of the Tennessee General Assembly who saw firsthand the devastation effects of TennCare on our state and was a part of the group to uh, the effort to dismantle it. Um, finally, I rise today as a representative of the 6th District of Tennessee where my constituents have told me over and over how they do not want Obamacare bankrupting our nation and getting between them and the, patient, and the uh, doctor. Um, Mr. Speaker, I know that the health care industry and I know that the new health care law is not the solution to our problem. Pretty soon, the health care law will be the problem. And I know this because 
Uh, for many of us in Tennessee, the president's new health care law is like a bad dream all over again. And let me tell you what I mean. Tennessee was the pilot project for universal health care. And the experiment was called TenCare. And put simply, the experiment failed. After TenCare passed, we watched the cost grow exponentially. And those of us in the legislature knew that if we did not do something, TenCare was going to bankrupt our state. And much like Obamacare, the sheer size of TenCare was more than government could handle. The government could not perform all of the functions of the medical in insurance industry. And promises of care and access were made, and promises were far beyond what our state could possibly do. It didn't take long before TenCare uh, became riddled with waste and fraud and abuse. And I can remember talking with people who had gone from doctor to doctor and specialist to specialist using TenCare to fill more than 50 prescriptions. Yes, 50 prescriptions is what they would put in front of me and tell me that TenCare was paying for, and it was all on the taxpayer's dime. TenCare became the monster that even the creators could not control. And today, TenCare is gutted only available to a small group of people, and Tennessee has been brought back from the brink of bankruptcy. Last month, Republican governors wrote to ask the administration, and I quote here, weigh the bill's costly mandates and grant states the authority to choose the benefit rules that meet the specific needs for their citizens, and close quote. The governors were asking for common sense solutions like waiving provisions that punish consumer driven plans like the most popular plan and the cost effective plan of health care savings account. Give the states the ability to do what states can do best and that is determine what's best for them. But the president shows no sign of granting states some flexibility and how they will apply Obamacare. And only yesterday President Obama said he is supporting letting the states propose their own health care plans by 2014. However, that would be only if he will not change the mandates for the states in the current law. So in one side of his speech, he says, yes, he will allow some flexibility. On the other side, he says, there still must be certain mandates. If the gen gentlewoman would uh, let me reclaim my time, it's kind of like, uh, you know, you can uh, keep what you like until you can't. And that's what we're seeing, and that's why, as I pointed out earlier, uh, that, that 733 waivers just in this year, 2011, have been granted by Secretary Sebelius to try to uh, fulfill that promise. But they can't do it. They can't keep up with it. There's a need for a new waiver every day. And I yield back to the gentlewoman. Thank you. Dr. Gangry, as you said, um, states will, uh, will still be forced to comply with benefit levels and mandates that are set by federal bureaucrats, not by the states themselves. That certainly doesn't give states rights. Uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services Kathleen Sebelius has already said that if the state were to propose its own plan, that they will be forced to provide with comprehensive, comprehensive coverage and that coverage will be defined by government. So, so much for being able to keep your plan or for the states to make a determination on what plan best suits them. So now President Obama wants every state to live through its own version of TenCare with ballooning budgets for each state and no way to curb their health care costs that will cripple the states during the time of already strapped budgets. It's simply unacceptable. Uh, we, the gentlelady would yield to me for just a second. I yield. I, I would say it's unconscionable and unacceptable. I yield back. We averted this disaster in Tennessee by dissolving TenCare. And now as a member of Congress, I will work to stop this financial and fiscal disaster that Obamacare will bring to our nation. This health care law must be replaced, and I believe this House can do it. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. And I, and I thank the gentlewoman from uh, Tennessee. I failed to mention, of course, that she is also a part of our uh, GOP uh, House Doctors Caucus. And uh, as she pointed out, uh, a registered nurse for many years in the great uh, volunteer state. So we appreciate Representative Black being with us tonight. Uh, before I uh, go to uh, uh, our next uh, speaker, 
uh, and yield some time, I wanted to, Mr. Speaker, go back to this uh, current uh, chart, and I tried to, I wish I had brought a magic marker, and I didn't, but I, I circled this, uh, I guess, third bullet point, uh, because I think uh, it's, it's really telling in regard to what's happened at the state level as a consequence of the provisions of Obamacare. Uh, and this bullet point says the boss, the government, the boss prohibits 16 million patients from buying private insurance by trapping them in Medicaid. And that's really what, what they've done, Mr. Speaker, uh, by expanding the, the Medicaid eligibility from 100 percent of federal poverty to 138. That means that a lot of the folks out there today who are uninsured, uh, can't afford health insurance, are, who are not eligible, they're not poor enough, if you will, to be eligible for this safety net program known as Medicaid. Uh, and the federal government, the boss, comes along with this idea of letting people buy their health insurance in an exchange in each state, maybe over the Internet. Uh, and if they are low income, uh, then they get a federal subsidy, not a federal state subsidy, but a federal subsidy. Well, clearly, as the Democratic majority and President Obama were crafting this thing, they figured out, well, you know, if we can shift more of these people into the Medicaid program, where the states have to pick up some of the tab, then we'll get them off our back. You know, we'll lower the cost. We'll make this thing work. Unfortunately, the poor states, and they are poor, all have to balance their budget. And the federal government doesn't. That's why we owe $13.4 trillion, and now they're even talking about wanting us to raise the debt ceiling so we can borrow some more money. It's a smoke and mirrors game, maybe even a Ponzi scheme, in my opinion, Mr. Speaker. Well, let me uh, uh, make sure that we don't run out of time. Uh, I think we have about... Uh, Mr. Speaker, can you tell me how much more time we do have? The gentleman has approximately 18 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At this time, I want to uh, yield to uh, another member of our uh, GOP House Doctors Caucus, a gentleman from uh, West Tennessee. Uh, I don't know whether the, the area is called Pell Mell or Paul Mall. Maybe he'll, he'll describe it to us when he stands to speak, but I'm talking about uh, a fine physician, a family practitioner, uh, Dr. Scott uh, Desjardins. Uh, Dr. Desjardins, thank you so much for being with us, and I yield your time. Thank you, Dr. Gingrey. And, and I yield from Marion County, which is uh, South Pittsburgh, would be the hometown. Before coming to Congress, I had the opportunity to serve the people in Tennessee as a primary care physician. In 1994, Tennessee embarked on an experiment with the Medicaid program, which became known as TenCare. Unfortunately, it never accomplished its goal of improving on the flawed Medicaid system. To the contrary, it became a breeding ground for waste, fraud, abuse, and inefficiency. I witnessed the frustration of my patients, my staff, and myself as we struggled to combat this bureaucratic web that forced us to spend time navigating administrative hurdles rather than focusing on quality care. Another pro problem that rapidly evolved was overutilization of the system. Often, only one family member was ill, but other family members were requested to be seen simply because it was more convenient than making other arrangements for the non-ill members, such as children, to be cared for elsewhere. This also became and continues to be a problem in the emergency rooms. There is no cost difference to the patients, so there is no disincentive to utilize the ER for non-emergent care. In fact, this is a national problem with up to 80% of ER visits being deemed non-emergent. This leads to much longer wait times in emergency rooms for those patients who are critically ill, and it should also be noted that ER visits are obviously much more expensive than office visits, further driving up the cost unnecessarily. 
A simple solution to improving the problem of overutilization would be implementing a nominal copay system in which office visits cost something like $5 per visit and ER visits might cost $20. This simple step would likely have far-reaching effects to reduce cost, overutilization, and thus increase availability of care for those who need it. We should see TenCare as a warning of the many problems that a government-run health care model creates. There are certainly issues with our nation's health care system that need to be addressed, and the GOP Doctors Caucus has no shortage of good ideas on how to make health care more affordable and expand coverage. But what we stand firm in saying is that Obamacare is not the answer to the problem, but rather it creates an even bigger problem. I yield back my time. I thank the gentleman uh, from Tennessee, and I thank him for making sure that I know exactly what county and counties he represents. I know it's a great state and a great part of the state, and we're very proud of the good doctor. Uh, at this time, uh, I want to uh, yield to uh, another freshman member of our class uh, of 87, their class of 87 strong, so fantastic uh, class, Mr. Speaker. We're awfully proud of each and, and every one of the new members, uh, but especially those who uh, have that health care background, that experience to come to this body, to this chamber, to this town, uh, and bring some professional expertise. Uh, we don't have all the answers, Mr. Speaker, and and I'm proud of these uh, physician colleagues of mine because they're not know-it-alls, but they know what they know and they know it well. And at this point, I would like to yield time uh, to the gentlewoman from New York, uh, ophthalmologist uh, Dr. Nan Hayworth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Speaker. I observe, sir, that you have brought uh, a sign to uh, the, the floor that talks about uh, stealing America's liberty. And one of the fundamental problems that, uh, that I perceive, and I'm not alone in this, but uh, in this entire scheme, if you will, that's represented by the Affordable Care Act, um, as it's been called, is that there was a failure to understand the very nature of American medical care when it's at its best, and we recognize every colleague of mine, uh, all of my Republican and medical colleagues have, have also uh, appreciated certainly that we want to see all Americans have access to good, affordable care and to have affordable, portable health insurance. That's not in dispute, so we honor those goals. But the means by which the ACA endeavors to achieve those goals go against the grain of the American culture. Our culture is one that has always allowed us to choose, that has allowed us uh, to pursue in terms of our medical care the very best that the world has to offer in terms of innovation and quality, motivation, incentive to invent and to do better. And the American medical consumer, our patients, expect no less than the best, nor should they receive anything less than the best. That's a very different way of thinking about care in a consumer society than is the case in so many other um, systems around the world that were cited as exemplars when the ACA was being formulated. We do not have, I can tell you from my experience with patients who have had care, who have lived in Europe for uh, variable periods of time, some Americans who have spent uh, sojourns in Europe because of business obligations um, and working with, uh, with colleagues from Europe. Historically, it's, a, it's rather a different model than we have here. American doctors are accustomed to, you know, jumping and doing and doing all they can and doing it fast, and, you know, my, my colleagues can certainly attest to that. Um, it's a little bit different sometimes overseas. They, they have a different kind of medical culture. Patients don't expect quite as much. Uh, it's, it's not the same sort of thing that we have here. Uh, and indeed, that's consonant with the fact that there isn't any other country's dream necessarily as there is an American dream. My mother's from England. She came to this country in 1948 because she was very distressed by national health care. Uh, there's no British dream. There's 
not, not necessarily a German dream or Japanese dream, but there is an American dream. This young lady yield back to me for yes, just sir, a second absolutely. before I yield back I'm to her. I'm just about done, yeah. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, it, what, what uh, the gentlewoman from uh, New York is, is referencing uh, is something that I, I have heard uh, from, from people in other countries that have government health insurance. And, and they say, well, well, I'm real happy with my government health insurance, and, and I know what's going on over here, and I'm thinking, my goodness gracious, uh, you're happy? What are you, what are you happy about? Well, you get to see the doctor within five minutes, and you always come out with at least three prescriptions. <laughs> now, if that's the, the definition of success, Mr. Speaker and my colleagues, that's not what American good old USA medicine is all about. That's right. That's right. Uh, it's time, quality time spent with that doctor, mm -hmm. uh, and maybe no prescriptions. And I yield back. Uh, sir, uh, precisely.